Right, here we go with the, uh, the final session of the afternoon, which is kind of looking back, but it's also looking forward. I think, it, I, I hope you've really enjoyed today. I, have to, I do think, if you were here last year, I think this year has been sort of a definite step up in terms of interest levels, in terms of the real issues that this whole industry had to face. And this is particularly appropriate now because the, the games have been and gone and we're still having the same conversations about how we're going to get people to engage in physical activity, how are we going to get people more healthy, how are we going to get people to take part in sport, what impact have the Olympics had on that, has that ship sailed, if so have we missed that boat, mixing lots of metaphors there and what are we going to do about it. So to, ha to talk about all those issues and also the one thing we mustn't do I think, given the nature of the panel that we have, is forget the kind of the joy of the summer because it was just the most fantastically upbeat six weeks or so that you can ever remember. We have the owner of the Paralympics, Tanny Gray Thompson, <laughs> Kate Hoey MP, who's also working with Boris Johnson at Grassroots Sport in London, Sally Gunnell, Olympic gold medalist, who's very much at the forefront in the, in the south of her sort of well-being program, Kate Walsh, captain of the Great Britain hockey team who won a bronze medal. So we've actually, we do actually have one athlete in the room, with all due respect, Sal, you know, uh, and, uh, and Richard Caborn, who is uh, the boss man at the Amateur Boxing Association, former sports minister and man steeped in experience of dealing with sports. So it's a, it's a pretty high-flying high bunch of people in terms of actual practicality of sport, competing and actually ensuring that as many people as possible can take part in it. So this is very much an interactive session. So if any of you want to ask anybody anything, then please don't, don't wait. Just stick your hand up and we'll kick on. Um, I don't know why, I thought I'd start with you, Tani, just as a, as a, in many ways, an obvious starting point. Three months on from the Games, just about, what, what, what is your take on where, what, what it's done? What have the Olympics and Paralympics done? What haven't they done? Um, the Paralympics were amazing. I mean, I, I kind of spent 10 years saying they were going to be the best ever, um, which I think Paul Dyke wanted to kill me for most of the time. Um, but actually, it kind of surpassed anything I thought it would be. And the, the risk for me was always about getting people in to watch. And when you think across the athletic sessions, so the capacity of the stadium was 82,000. Across the Paralympics, there were only 688 tickets that weren't sold. Um, for me, that was amazing. Um, and I think in terms of, of disability rights, it changed uh, a significant number of people's attitudes towards disabled people. Whether it's changed attitudes towards disability sports, and that filters down to allow disabled children to take part in sport in schools or to go to clubs, I think we still have a, a big challenge. Um, I still get a huge number of parents who write to me to say their disabled child is excluded in school. Um, a parent wrote to me a couple of weeks ago saying their disabled child was refused to, uh, they wouldn't let the child join two sports clubs. They were finally allowed to join the third and after the first training session, um, the coach said he can't come back because he hasn't made enough progress. That boy was five, um, you know, and I don't know any performance director that runs a squad like that. So I, I still think there's, there's this wonderful fairy dust around the Paralympics and it's amazing and, you know, Johnny Peacock and Oscar and all that stuff. But actually it needs to translate to something better on the ground. And um, I think, you know, there's still a lot of work to do with governing bodies and with clubs to, to make sure that we, we have the appropriate access. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult because the Paralympics was never going to change the world. And I think it's unrealistic to think it was. It, it could change some people's attitudes, but it's suddenly after the Games, it was never going to be perfect. And I think that's where we have to have a bit of a reality check. Kate, uh, Tani talks about the, the fairy dust of the Olympics. If you're working in grassroots sport in London, and I know the overwhelming majority of people in the room are not from London, you know, but maybe we can't talk in general terms about around the country. But in London, is that fairy dust still working its magic or is it, is it dissipating? Well, I think one of the most wonderful things for getting the actual sport, and I agree totally about the Paralympics, because having been to Sydney as sports minister and what was a great Paralympics, yet they couldn't fill the stadium. And, and you know, was, we have really set the target and the ball, as they say, really, really high on that. So I agree with all that. In London, I think the, um, what, what I liked about it was the, the whole attitude of people in London changed. You know, there was a really wonderful feeling on the tubes and those of us who travel daily and find all the miserable things that go on in London, it was just wonderful. Now that, of course, has gone. Um, people are still back now, a few of them to being quite rude again and all that kind of thing. But I think there is still, you see, the problem when I talk about legacy is that, and I would go around various community clubs in London and I would say to them, do you think you know, what did you get out of the Olympics? What was, or the Paralympics? 
did you enjoy it? And they'll all sort of say yes, but then if you actually, and this is what the media do, they go up and they say, well, what have your, has your club got anything out of the Olympics? And of course, if the club or the group say, no, no, we haven't had actually anything, then it goes down as being, you know, we've got nothing out of the Olympics. So I think the word legacy is always very, very difficult. What we've done in London, and we did start quite early, to be fair to Boris, he put money in right at the beginning, and we ring-fenced that, and we started to bring London together, because one of the problems was people didn't work together. We got the community groups together, we got the different sports across London to work together, and we've spent our money wisely. But it's only a small amount in, in, in the huge amount, scale of things. But what we have done, and, and uh, uh, was mentioned earlier about the shortage of perhaps coaches in, in some sports, we put a lot of our money into ensuring that the sports do have the people to now be there to help when these thousands of extra people want to get involved in a sport because there was a great shortage, and there still is, and there's a shortage across the country, and that's going to be a problem we're going to have to tackle. But as time goes on, that memory that you talked about will become you know, less and less. We really have a very short opportunity to actually show that it is going to make a difference, not just the money that's coming in, because it's not all about money, it's how people work together on the ground and how working with sectors like yours, the, voluntary, the real voluntary sector can actually work with you and gain from that. Uh, Richard, if I could ask you this question, but we've got a, you know, a gathering of people here, me, all who work in the health industry, a lot who work in the, in the physical health industry, a lot of work in the physical activity industry, who run fitness clubs and things like that. I'm sure a lot of them were thinking over the last 12 months or so that there would be an avalanche of people. They'd be, they'd be, you know, they'd be closing the doors at 9 o'clock in the morning. We can't let any more in because everybody's going to want to play sport. Do you, th do you feel that that just simply hasn't happened? And if it hasn't happened... What did, what did we in the room, if you like, in this industry not do right? Or was there a, a bigger some factor at play there that meant that didn't happen? Well, I, it hasn't happened, I think, for a number of If you stand back, I mean, I was involved in the Olympics in, in, in 2001, and I, I'll never forget uh, the advice I was given uh, by the civil servants, which said, we need this like a hole in the head. Uh, so if you view it from that and you look out, 11 years and say what happened in London, it was fantastic. There's no doubts about that. When you look three months after that and you look back and you say, what could we have done differently to have actually develop that legacy? Well, there are a number of mistakes that we made. Uh, and I'm not saying this being critical, you know, but I, it's, and hindsight's a great thing. You can make some great decisions on hindsight and I'm about to do that now, uh, but, I'm, but I'm not blaming people. But I give you one straight away, it's not gone away yet, and it won't go away until somebody takes a quite a bold political decision, that's to sort out the stadium. The next big mistake was made by Sport England in 2008, and that was to predicate the whole of the participation, because it changed dramatically the policy of driving up partic participation in anticipation of the Olympics on the governing bodies. And it didn't work, and they've now had to revisit that again. And I think one of the weaknesses was, we didn't engage sectors. You know the debate that's gone here this morning about health and, and the, how can we get fitness, how can we get prevention rather than cure into the health service? Well, sport is one of those. We're now attempting that with the National Centre for Sports and Exercise Medicine, which is actually part of the Olympic legacy that ought to have been discussed probably 18 months, two years ago. We're now doing it to affect it after the Olympics. We're engaging all the top tier sponsors of the Olympics, we're involved in the whole of the health service in that, as well as Mike Millens, as well as Diabetes, as well as Heart Foundation. All those have now been involved, but that ought to have been done some months before. So we are where we are. I still think there's opportunities there, but it has got to be about a collective view about where do we take well, where that are type we? of where, where, where are we? Where are we? I think that, first of all, as I said, I think we're now setting up the National Centre for Sports and Exercise Medicine. I think organisations have changed their name. Why has this changed its name to UK Active? Because they want to go from fitness to activity. It's only, a, it's only a, in a word, but it actually the perception is quite important. It is about moving that. Where does sport play its role in that? How can you actually get what you've learned with this great development of elite sport that you've got in the Loughboroughs, the Baths, and so on, how can that be put into the health service? How can you get exercise on prescription? How can you develop all that? And I think that's now, now, that's now been, uh, is now being thought through. 
But we need to do that in a much more collective way than the silos that we, that we are actually, and we drove it down the silos, and I think that's where we lost the opportunity to really affect the spirit of that Olympics and build the capacity up in clubs, in coaching, in development, and the whole fitness agenda that we could have actually capitalized on more effectively. Now, I'm as much to blame as anybody else, because I was there, and the decision makers, but one's been honest about it, and I think that's where we can actually now capitalize. But in saying that, our legacy is as good, if not better, than any of the other previous Olympics that it's gone through. And I, like Kate, I've, I've went down to Sydney, I've been to Barcelona, I've been in Munich, been around, and I think we've got as good a legacy overall than they have. Could we have done better? We could have done a lot better. The, the, the lines all get blurred between sport and health and physical activity. Sal, so, so, I mean, as an athlete, and now somebody who's involved in wellness, if you like, what, what's your take on where the emphasis should be now? Well, I always um, believe that, you know, you're always going to get that 20% that are always going to be out there. They're doing the runs, they're on the bike, they're in the gym. Um, and it's really about, for me personally, reaching out to, that, to the rest of them. And, and I'm sure everybody tries to do that in, in here. Um, and, and it's how you do that. Um, and yes, you know, UK Active are now putting place, working with the government and getting into the NHS and trying to do that. But it is, it has to be a mind change. You know, people have to think differently. Um, and I believe it's about, you know, making small changes can actually go a long way. Like? It's, well, you know, there's so many different areas, you know, looking at nutrition, looking at, you know, different types of exercise, but it's trying how do people fit that into their everyday life. Um, I'm working very much within the corporate work because so many people um, have problems through, you know, the busy lives that they lead, uh, and companies are now realizing that they need to have a look at the productivity and they have some tearsm within business because, you know, they've created this stressful situation. Uh, they're demanding so much of people and, and a lot of the injury problems are coming from work. Um, and, you know, how much better they could be and more productive and, and um, you know, when you're looking at figures as well. But those small changes can come from you know, what you eat, you know, what you grab before you go to work, what you're eating at lunchtime, how you keep those energy levels up, to exercise, how it best way to deal with stress. You know, it, it's all those little things. You know, if you're trying to work as a team at work and you've got someone that's, you know, moaning and shouting at you often, it, it's around his attitude is probably, by doing exercise, is going to help with everybody within that, that team that he's probably working on. But it's giving that information across, and it's, it's, it, but it has to be addressing the, the mind change, because you can't just give all this information. People have got to want to do it. Um, so, you know, and so much from what I did from running is about the mind um, and how strong that mind is, and you've got to get in, you've got to tap into those people, um, and they've got to make those changes, and that's how you're going to reach out to that um, 80%. Uh, and, and I think it is, you know, we are only three months on, um, and yes, we should have had things in place, um, but also, I, you know, it's not what just happens in the six months. We're looking at this in the long term, and again, that's where those small changes can make, can go a long way in, in all sorts of areas that what everybody's doing out there as well. Kate, you were there, you, you were doing it, and you're now doing some PR work as well, which is why you've been here all day as well, despite the fact you're, you've now quickly nipped off and got your GB tracksuit to put on. Um, what, what, what's your, what impressions have you formed of, of today, which are, you know, everybody else in this room has, has listened to, as, as an athlete, as, as somebody who, who did it, and did it in some style, and perhaps hoped an awful lot would happen as a consequence of that, and maybe it hasn't? Um, I think, personally, from a, a hockey point of view, I think we were, were quite proactive as a governing body in, in trying to put things in place before the Olympics, so we... Um, pushed um, back to hockey and rush hockey, so different ways to get involved with the sport because people are busy, you know, their working lives take over, families take over, they need different ways to engage with sports, so back to hockey, you know, is, is low time, you can just literally pay a few pounds and turn up, it's ad hoc whenever you want, rush hockey, five aside, um, using facilities that are already there, it can be with your colleagues, you know, at lunchtime. that kind of thing, so hockey, I think, we're quite proactive and, and that has been rolling out as well afterwards, Lots of us have been into clubs around the country and had brilliant feedback from women who have started work, had families, stopped playing hockey, but have watched us join the Olympics and said, I'm going to take that back up again, and have just gone to these back to hockey sessions. And that, for me, has been fantastic. And, and if we can get more of that you know, rolling out, then all the better. Because for me as an athlete, yes, I want to do well, and I want to win medals, and I want to, to represent my country, but I want to leave 
something good behind. I want people to play hockey, to play any sport, to get out there and be active. Um, but I think there's definitely a, still a long way to go, yeah. Any questions from the floor to, to anyone about any particular subject? And uh, you know, I'll happily keep chatting to them, but I don't want to go down roads that perhaps you don't want to go down because you'd like to hear something else. So if you want to stick your hands up for any questions to anyone politically or athletically, please do. Otherwise, I, I will keep chatting. All gone quiet for the moment. Then I, I will keep chatting. All right, so, so Tani, I mean, you know, you, you've had considerable experience across, you know, two, two decades and more of, of Paralympics, but of, but of elite international sport as well. But in, elite international sport does not necessarily transcend to people being active in society, does it? You know, it almost acts in isolation from that. Is there any way that you think that that link can be tightened and actually one can begat the other? I, th I think it's really difficult because, you know, our local athletics club has been absolutely flooded with young girls turning up saying, I want to be the next Jess Ennis. And then you take them for the sort of the first Friday night training session in November, you know, and they go, actually, no, I don't. Um, you know, so, um, and that's before, you know, they're training 15 times a week, 50 weeks a year, you know. So um, it's hard because there's this sort of view that, yeah, it's, it's amazing to be a gold medal winning Olympian or Paralympian. The reality is really dull and boring. Um, so I, I think, you know, you're going to get some sort of attrition um, because of that. But I think there's lots of things we can do. I mean, I think, you know, probably all sports can look at how they're run. They can be a little bit more exciting, you know, a bit more dynamic. You know, club structure, you know, our club is, is basically run by some quite old people. Um, you know, so it's, you know, you've, you've got 10-year-olds come along basically being coached by people who are probably old enough to be their great-grandparents. So we need to get more young people into coaching so, you know, that... that it's, it's, it's a bit more exciting. Um, you know, I think in athletics, some of our competition structure could be a bit more exciting. Um, also, I think there's, I know we talked about this morning about women in sport, but you look at how many women of my age who dropped out of physical activity because they hated PE in schools. And, and other countries have done an amazing job at engaging with mums because there's some research out there that shows that mums are much more likely, if they have a boy and a girl in the family, they're much more likely to take their son to play sport than their daughter because of their bad experience themselves. So I think we've got a massive job to do, convincing mums that their daughters should be fit and healthy. Um, and then back to old PE in schools. Um, you know, most of that's really dull, I have to say. Um, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of competitive sport, but actually that's just not right for a huge number of young women. Um, you know, and we should be offering Zumba and boxer size and, and all those other things. And I know it's quite hard. Um, I, I think PE should be part of the core curriculum. It should be measured. You should measure it by Ofsted or in Wales by Yestin and, you know, and, and then it will have priority. You know, and we, you know, I think the thing we're brilliant at doing in this country, we're brilliant at writing reports, having consultations, writing 25 drafts of a document, consulting till you're sick to death of it, and then we don't do anything with it. And if there are awards for that, we would win. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think if, if P's not measured in school, and we don't, physical literacy is a huge passion of mine as well. If we're not teaching really good skills to three, four, five-year-olds, there's no wonder there's a huge dropout rate. So I, I don't think it's actually that difficult to do. Um, it's, it's, there has you to know, be collective will. Collective will, and just stop the government, any government, working in silos. I mean, I was at a meeting the other week with the Department of Health, um, Education, and DCMS, and it was, like, amazing, because they'd never spoken to each other you know, in, in this sort of format. And, you know, they're all going to go, ooh, you know, panicking. And actually, do you know what? You, you can actually save a lot of money if you talk to each other. You know, I, I don't think it's rocket science. It's just we need some people in those positions who get it. Well, you have, well, you have two former sports ministers here, both of whom were, you know, passionate about, about sport and about health. And, you know, and Kate, there must have been times when you must have felt, Kate Howey, you must have felt you were banging your head against a brick wall. No one was listening. Well, I mean, what we did do, I mean, it was even worse when I was sports minister, education and DCMS didn't speak to each other. And one of the things I did, which was actually, uh, we had to do all sorts, break all sorts of rules to do it, was bring in Sue Campbell to work between the two departments to actually work out what, how the education department, who were responsible for sport and schools, and how our department, which was responsible for sport, could actually work together in terms of school sport. And of course, she managed to get that together. That was where the whole school sport partnerships and everything started. But the department that we've still not cracked, I think we have cracked a lot of that in terms of education and in terms of the home office, but the Department of Health it has the huge amounts of money and just a tiny percentage. And we mentioned this when Colin Moynihan and myself did a report years ago called um, 
raising the bar about just that tiny little percentage of the Department of Health overall money, if it was actually brought to the other side in terms of preventative, it would make such a difference. But I'm very interested, everything we do in London, and with our smallish but relatively good amount of money that acts as a catalyst, we say everything has to have some element of inactives in it. I notice, you know, you're not called UK active, but actually, you know, what this is really about is UK inactives. And we make sure that every bit of funding has to, they have to show, uh, whether it's the club or the, the local authority, if they're coming through for something, that they are actually looking outwards to the inactives. We don't want just more people playing football more times a week or swimming more times a week. That still goes down as increasing participation, but it's actually not getting to the people we want. So I think, I think there is, you know, I just think there is it, it, an awful lot about this is, as various people have said, and it's not, it's not rocket science, it's about actually people knowing what everybody else is doing, working together and ensuring that they're not spending their time competing and that's why we did, and we brought, for example, in, in, um, in, in athletics, we brought the athletics clubs together in London, tried to get something which was going to look at how they would spend the money in a way that was going to link in with the schools. And the old thing that was around when Richard and we all been there was, how do you get the clubs, the local sports clubs, to work with the local schools? And the two things together, if th those, those two were working much more closely. And it has, there's an awful lot of good things still going on. And I don't have the gloom and doom about school sport that some people have. I know in my own borough in Lambeth, in, in North Lambeth in particular, the primary schools are getting an amazing amount of physical, good quality physical education. It's actually happening. But, but, but the sorry, easiest sorry to interrupt, thing Kate. Uh, your, your colleague, Andy Burnham, was sitting at this, standing at this lectern this morning. He probably would say something different. He was saying he was in absolute despair about well, school sport. Well, I, I, I must make sure he comes and visits North Lambeth because I tell you, we, because it, but it hasn't come from government money direct. What it's come through is through having a sports hub in the area where we've then got the coaches coming in to be worked and trained through, so that they can go out into the schools. And every primary school in Lambeth now is getting a far better quality provision than they've ever got because we've managed to keep the school sport partnership but just operating in a different way. And I remember way back years ago when Sue Campbell sat in my office and we were drawing up this little map and she drew this map. And any of you know who Sue, Sue Campbell is? She, she, it's brilliant at that. She drew a little map showing the primary schools clustering, then the secondary school, the person being released to work in those schools. And we always meant it to be something that was going to raise the importance of sport so that ultimately the schools themselves would actually start to see that as a priority. And I think what has happened in some areas, the school sports partnerships worked so well that the schools saw that that was actually important. And even if the money went down, they, may, they found ways of working with their sports clubs to make it continue to happen. Now, yes, it would be much better if there was lots of money pouring in, but sometimes when there's a shortage of money, people have to work differently. And that is happening in some areas. It's not a panacea, but you know, I just get sometimes a little bit fed up that it's, it, everyone is so negative because in some areas there's some brilliant stuff going on and some very, very good volunteers well, who've carried on. Pa pass it on to Richard, I know. People are, people are negative though, because you've spoken about 20%, Kate, you spoke about 20% participating and 80% doing nothing. And we keep, and if, you, you know, if you've been able to be here first thing this morning, we were just regaled with slide after slide talking about obesity levels and how everybody's gonna physically internally combust in 20 years time because we're all gonna be so fat. You know, when, when you're confronted by figures like that, it's very hard not to be pessimistic when again, Andy Burnham stands here and talks about participation levels in sport th falling through the floor. So, you know, it, it, it lies down, lies in statistics. Richard, you've... <laughs> well, I, I think it's true what Kate's saying, and, and, and it's very patchy all over the country. There's no doubts about that. But, I mean, you know, my own city of Sheffield, we are under huge pressure, Kate, I'll tell you, because the north is not the same as the south, unfortunately, with the distribution of monies to local government. I can tell you that with a 50% reduction in non-discretionary spend, 90% of all sports facilities are by local authorities, and it has been said that a third of all sports facilities under local authorities will either close or reduce activities in the next three years. You've reduced from 160 millions, the money that went into school sports partnerships, 
There's a ring fence of about 60 million, which if it doesn't get ring fenced again, will fall out the budget, and there'll be no money in for school sports partnerships. So that is a reality, and that's what people are having to deal with now, and it's very, very difficult. And so there who, is a so north-south divide on well, this. Well, who's going to pick up the slack then? Well, I'm just going to go on the positive side of it, in the sense that my sport, the sport I have to be cha chair of, which is, which is boxing, we've moved and adapted boxing into non-contact boxing. For them that don't know, it's not, it is a contact, it's a contact with a bag or a pad or whatever. And, and that has expanded use. We're into 2,500 schools now. We are in pretty well in every, I think, every boxing gym, uh, sorry, every gym around the country. So a sport has actually gone out there. And I'm looking now with the British amateur boxing, which is the ones that deal with the elite, how they can bring some of our coaches within the ABA up to standards, at least level two. If we can, we can put them into schools, we can put them into some of your gyms, and we can find employment for them. So we have adapted to that. We've, we've changed the sport and made it much more user-friendly and much more into the fitness world, possibly, than the sports world. But that's, I, I think, with some you know, creative thinking with a lot of people within the ABA. So that is happening. Can I just say one other thing? Yeah, go on, yeah. There is a, there's, a, there's another big fault line, and I said this, I said this to Sport England and UK Sport. <laughs> there's a bit of resentment of those in grassroots sport of what they see with the elite sport. And we've just got to be careful that we don't actually allow that to develop. We need all that's been learned by all these great Olympians and all the people around, the coaches and the nutritionists, and the, that we actually get that into the body of British sport. Because at the moment, it's stuck up there, and there's a bit of a resentment that we've ring-fenced all that for elite, and down here, we're not getting much gain. And I think that we just need to look at that, and if not, we will find ourselves in some, some difficulties within the sports themselves. Okay, we've got lots of hands up now, so I'll start with the gentleman there and then move around a bit. I could see a few critical glances when you mentioned non-contact boxing, you know, because, oh, don't hit me. So, but anyway, yes, it's yours, so yeah, go on. Uh, yeah, my question's about um, g sort of linking with this negative perception point. And I was in the States about 10 years ago, and I was lucky enough to go to one of the US Olympic training camps. I had three at the time. And in America, there seems to be this culture and this attitude that success is celebrated. So they take young kids, they identify their talent, and they see talent as a very positive thing. And there's the collegiate system. Whereas over here, last week, there was a report about bullying. And they were saying that kids that are good at sport or drama or singing are getting bullied more and more. And then we see that our professional athletes, kind of the Olympics, unfortunately, was probably the exception rather than the rule. In that every day we open our papers and we see professional athletes like footballers are being portrayed so negatively. Do you think there's a deeper sort of sociological problem with celebrating success in this country and that linking with sport compared, Sally, compared to America? Scott, there's, a, there's a big d question for you. Sal was looking at Sal was going, oh, I really want to answer that question, so go on. Oh, exactly. Um, I think it, it does all go back to the culture and how we have to change that culture. Um, and, and I've seen firsthand as well in America how they... How they celebrate that success and you know and I do think we need to be more positive over there but I also think that um, you know we need to get our kids very active from this very young age uh, and embrace you know just the basics of balance coordination because I'm just seeing kids that can't even stand on one leg um, you know let alone run around a little pitch you know they can't do that so I think it has to be you know from a very young age that we're engaging them in that sort of activity. Um, and also, you know, we keep going back to schools, but probably they, the kids spend half of their life um, outside of school, you know, at home, and how important parents are and the people around them are, again, as role models in their life. So if you, you know, if your five-year-old see you sitting on the sofa eating pizza all day, that's, that's what you're teaching them. So, I, I, you know, I think it's a, an all-round culture change that we have to embrace and and yes you've got to have some positive um media out there and positive areas to be able to grasp but it has to be done from that young age and make it that way of life kate did you ever feel that somebody was not, not bullying you because nobody bully you in their right minds but but that you ever felt that people were were disparaging you because you were successful at an early stage um actually sport helped me opposite way i was bullied for i was a little runt believe it or not 
grown now. Um, and I was, I was bullied at school. And actually, sport gave me confidence. I was so shy because I was bullied. I would blush in front of a large group. I, you know, I wouldn't want to speak up. And actually, sport helped me grow, be confident, become stronger, be able to interact with others in a more you know, calm and in a manner that I felt that they would want to listen to me. And so I think, as Sally said, that starts from a young age. So I think, you know, as we talked about this morning, this is a, a global problem. This isn't just a problem that, you know, we've got in Great Britain and in England. It's a global problem. And I think it's, it's developing sport with youngsters, you know, whether it's for fun or whether it's because they're going to be elite, whatever it's going to be, get them playing sport because it, it's good for them, good for your well-being, good for your self-confidence, good for your fitness, your health your nutrition, your mental state, everything. And it's, it has to start from a young age.